Hi, this is Amy. And this is Chrissy on KCC Live, and you're listening to The Out There Show. On today's show, you'll hear lots of different voices. There's me, Amy, Kate, Alex, Andrew, and a few others. Today's show, we're going to look at transgender issues and trans in the media. We wanted to start by looking at... Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. I literally have no idea what you're on about. LGBT is lesbian, gay, bi, transgender, sexual, or something like that, isn't it? Uh, LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, but there's a, a sort of a longer version that's quite common right now, which is LGBTQQIP2SAA, which is a bit long winded, but the two Qs are for queer and questioning, the I is for intersex. P is for pansexual. The two S's mean uh, two spirit. A would be for asexual and the second A for allies. But that also means that a lot of people just put like LGBTQ plus or LGBT plus because obviously it's a long, <laughs> it's a lot of things to sort of remember. Uh, I'm going to take a wild guess. I think it's Liverpool Broadcasting TV Company, uh, which are based in uh, Kirkdale. Yeah, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. Lesbian, bi, gay, straight, trans. I don't know whether it's in that order, though. The Station with Attitude. KCC Live. So, LGBT plus stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender plus. But the full term, it's it's got a lot of letters in it now because they've sort of consolidated into one. So, it is actually... LGBT TQQIAAP. So that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, ally, and pansexual. Um, they cover a whole broad spectrum of different things. And as our shows go on, I'm sure we should cover them all. So don't be too put off if you're confused. All will become clear. Just keep listening. So, first off, when people think of transgender, a lot of people think of things like this. So that's drag. That that's that's art. That's that can be a man dressed as a woman, a woman dressed as a man, and usually it, it's really over exaggerated and it's done in the name of art. Any performing art. Um, lots of fans of Drag Race out there. You know you you know what drag is, and um, we've got some cracking drag queens in the UK and in America as well, and they're really talented. But it's not transgender. So basically, transgender is when your head doesn't fit with your body in the terms of being male or female. So that's what transgender is. And then transsexual, a lot of the pla- a lot of places say that it's like a desire to have surgery, but it's also quite an old sort of saying that basically means transgender. And then you've got transvestite. And a transvestite is a man who dresses as a woman, usually for, for like kicks. It's not the same as a person who's transgender. The station with attitude, KCC Live. So transgender people have had it really quite bad in like recent history. Um, there was a lady called Marsh P. Johnson, and she was one of the key people in the Stonewall riots. Um, and for those that don't know, the Stonewall riots happened in New York, in Greenwich Village, uh, around 1969. And what happened was there was a inn called the Stonewall Inn, and it was where people were known to congregate who were gay and trans, and, um, you know, drag queens and stuff as well. And it was raided by the police because, of course, it was illegal then to be homosexual. Um, and basically, Marsha was there with the riots, and, you know, she through that, she was arrested... Um, and when the judge, it's a great story, when the judge turned around and said to her, what does the P stand for in Marsha P. Johnson? She turned around and said, pay it no mind. And the judge let her off. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it pays to be a bit cheeky. Um, but yeah, so she then through that was one of the founder members of the Gay Liberation Front. Um, and she did an awful lot of good work for the LGBT community. Um, she founded one of the first shelters for gay and trans street kids in New York in the 70s. Um, at one point, a journalist turned around and said to her, you know, why is right and what's going on? And she just turned around and went, darling, I want my gay rights now. 
So she was one of many transgender people that have been in the limelight. Um, more like looking at now, we've got people like Caitlyn Jenner, we've got people like Laverne Cox, Chaz Bono, who's Cher's son. And in the radio in the UK, we have Stephanie Hurst, who was originally known as Simon Hurst and was on the Capital Yorkshire Breakfast um, show. And she's a good one for her story to read as well, if you get a chance to give her a Google. The station with attitude. ACC Live. So I first realised that there was something different about me, maybe when I was four or five. Um, I knew I wanted to be a boy. Um, I told my mum and it didn't really go anywhere I just remember <laughs> I just remember a sort of shocked expression on her face um, and basically I just went about living my life as a very boyish girl I suppose um, I would try and get more masculine stuff and probably end up with gender neutral stuff um, most of the time and maybe end up being a little bit disappointed um, I just as I grew older I think I just became more and more uncomfortable um, basically as I was growing up and puberty was really horrible <laughs> um i didn't i didn't really cope very well with being a teenager i sort of was just angry a lot of the time um i just i was very probably clinically depressed for a good portion of my teenage years um and was bullied quite badly through school um and but I survived I kept on going I started um I started performing through school um in terms of like drama and music and stuff like that that was all I was really interested in in school because it gave me an escape um then when I left school I went to a couple of different colleges and I ended up at, um, at Nosley Community College and I found this brilliant performing arts course where um, I felt at home. I sort of felt safe in a sense as a performer um, and it allowed me to just get on with performing and acting and being involved in the college radio station without having to really um, recognise what was going on within me on on a gender identity level. Um, so it gave me an, it, it, it gave me an escape from that in a sense um so i wasn't thinking about it all that much and that was that was very helpful at the time um i the i sort of sunk back into depression once um once i'd left college and started applying for uni and um I didn't have a great time at uni, but uni sort of brought all of this to a head and made me acknowledge to myself that yeah, I am I am trans and um I need to start living as as someone who's trans. Um I need to I need to be true to myself. Um and since then it's got it's got an awful lot better um i'm very lucky cuz 
I've got a lot of supportive friends and family. Um, so I've been very lucky on that front. I've done, I've done a lot since, since then. Um, it's helped me to just get on with my life and just be more confident and open with people and um, it's been nothing but positive I feel even though sometimes people don't get it which is fine I'm not looking for people to get it I'm just looking for people to accept that this is who I'm saying who I am um, and up to the present day I mean I've got a full time job I've got wonderful friends wonderful family um, I think I think I'm doing quite well at the moment um, we'll just see what happens this is FM KCC Live I think one of the main issues still for a lot of trans people it's just been taken seriously by society a lot of the time. Um, people still tend to think it's okay to do tranny jokes and stuff like that on TV. It's just not. <laughs> and yet it still happens all the time. Um, I think that's one of the main issues. And people keep on coming out with this phrase, political correctness gone mad. And like... Because there's more stuff about people being gender fluid out these days than I think sometimes people get confused about that. And it people need more education, basically, I feel. Um, but at the same time, it is steadily getting better, but I still think we're, we're behind where we need to be. So as far as support goes... Um for what is out there now and what they used to be, maybe at a time that you were accessing it, if you're not accessing it now. Um, was it easy to find? Do you feel there's enough information or enough support out there for people? Um, I think it could be a lot easier to find. I think sometimes people are still scared to go to NHS pathways and stuff like that, even if you're planning to transition or whatever. Um because it's still all a bit of a postcode lottery in terms of like transitioning because your doctor might never even heard of a GIC, for example. Um or like there there are more services around but they need to be better funded and better publicised, I feel. And what about ones that are not necessarily sort of like NHS related ones um, that are done the, by community or there are so there are a growing number of support groups around which is nice to see. Like there's stuff like mermaids, um there's a couple of adult um trans support groups in Liverpool. Um there's one that I still attend sometimes called um Live Fast Network. Um there's a group called Spirit Level. Um the, there is information out there. There's a group called Intrust as well. Um, it it can be difficult to find if you're not if you don't know where to go though. And so, would you recommend just kind of like internet, use the internet and yeah, get support? Yeah, I, I think needed? I think a lot of the time, a lot of trans support stuff is internet based, and it's like on forums and stuff like that. I've 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 used some forms in the past but it's not really my thing i'd rather be face to face with someone and a cup of tea yeah <laughs> because it's just easier to interact with someone in a more meaningful way i feel face to face yeah okay so the last question on this is what do you wish that people knew about trans people that we're, we're just like you we're, we're just ordinary people just trying to live our lives as best as we can um, we're not we're not looking for your approval. We're not looking for your praise. We just want we just want to just live as authentically as possible, and just be respected for it, basically. And sometimes I don't think that respect exists. It does more more so now, but 
we've still got a long, a long way to go. This is FM KCC Live. Okay, so this is Chrissy on KCC Live, and I have got Z on the phone with me. Hi. Hello. I have got a handful of questions um, for for you, Z. Um, I'm going to start off by asking, how should I address you? Is it he or she? And um, and why this is important? It's she. Um, trans people have various ways of being addressed. Some people don't mind. There's like famous example is Eddie who who does who famously says that they don't mind what you call them. However, if someone decides that they would rather be he or she or they, you should honour that pronoun. That's someone's identity and that's how someone likes to be addressed. And if someone, it, it's giving someone the respect that, that they have asked for. And I, I think anything other than that is, is disrespectful. Yeah. And is it best to always just ask rather than shy away from it? it would, you, would you say it's easy just to ask the question? I, I sometimes think that if it's obvious, if, you know, if, you know, I... If my friends are calling me she and you're in a situation where everyone else is calling me she and, and there's no other difference going on, you will sometimes still get that very ignorant person will come over and be like, you know, mm. you're right, he, they, you know, uh, and yeah. so on. Um, and I think sometimes people do it purely as like, um, uh, almost like a, I know better than you kind of thing. Yeah, like a but put down maybe? I, yeah, totally. And I, I would rather someone just, someone asked rather than got it wrong. But I do sometimes also think that if you can kind of get it right without having to ask. Um, yeah, don't draw attention to yeah. things if unnecessary, really, just for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think how you ask is important as well. If you're out with a group of friends and everyone's having a great time and then you, right in the middle of the conversation, go, so are you a fella or a gal? That can be just as heartbreaking as someone, you know. Um, per, you know, really, it's better to kind of quietly, politely ask yeah. differently. How, how would you like to be addressed? I think it's just about being um, kind and regardless of the situation, just be, like you said, respectful and a bit kind to their feelings regardless of what the situation is. Totally, totally. And I mean, you wouldn't single out someone's sexuality and it's very similar to how, the treatment of how trans people are being treated now is very similar to how um, LGB people were being treated kind of, you know, back in like kind of like the 60s and 70s and 80s and so on. Mm. Um, where there was this kind of wave of, like, panic about it. Yeah. Um, and right now, you wouldn't, in the middle of a conversation, say out with friends, go, so, are you gay or what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, would, you wouldn't do it. It would just be a really com- uncomfortable, awkward situation, and, and it, you know, it wouldn't be acceptable. Whereas, for some reason, to suddenly, in the middle of a conversation, ask if someone is trans, it's still totally yeah fine yeah that leads on to the next question which is for anyone who's listening who's not fully um understanding what it means can you explain um what transgender means well trans trans comes from the term transition so it's the transition agenda so i was assigned male at birth when transitioning to female and that's quite a simple easy understanding of trans but trans is actually now used as a term for basically anyone who is Mm non-binary which means they don't fit the binary spectrum of male or female, which kind of, it takes people a little bit of time to wrap their head around sometimes. But if you kind of look through history and you look through culture and you look through even just recent culture, there's plenty of people and there's plenty of people in the media who haven't fitted those gender roles of just male and female. And there's plenty of people who sit in the middle or, you know, are more on one side than the other and so on. And that is essentially transgender. It's just when somebody does not fit in with the binary idea of male and female gender. I think that's a really nice way to explain it. Um, yeah. You came out as transgender after um, some of the success with the band. Um, and so yeah. would you say that uh, you created Queen Z as a way to deal with gender dysphoria or just um, as an identity? Totally, totally. And I've been quite open about that and how um, because transgender people are such a minority of the population, I think it's not quite not 1%. Mm. Um, I didn't really have a lot of kind of trans role models around me you know I, I kind of felt slightly alienated and, and like you know a bit of an outcast and like a bit of a freak but then as I grew up I started to see kind of drag queens and I started to see um drag and, and I really remember you know like Paul Grady and stuff on the telly and, and being like oh oh my god wow I can I can really identify with this um and even though that that is different and, and I, sh- I should point out that drag and transgender are, are different things um that idea of having a persona and having like a kind of female persona, that was something that I really kind of um, 
was drawn to, and, and that's how I created Queen's And Queen's was essentially a chance for me to kind of live that part of my life that I, I felt like I couldn't do day to day. I'm learning more myself as this goes along, and some of the stories and the way some people have felt at a time, it's, it is quite heartbreaking. I mean, it's great that some people yeah. are able to cope better by doing certain things, but the idea that you have to do something in order yeah. is just quite sad. What was the reaction from people when you did come out? Um, people actually weren't surprised. And this is the thing as well. People seem to think that there's this preconception that one day you just change genders mm. and everyone goes, oh my God, whoa, where did that come from? What happened? You know, I, I told my parents, my mum just kind of rolled her eyes and was like, yeah, could, you know, <laughs> could have guessed that one. And, and, and the same, you know, I told, I told my band at the time, there was just the two of us in the band and I, I told Jay, he's a guitarist and he was like, yeah, yeah, no, we, we've all known for ages. <laughs> I, and it's, it, it's one of them, you know, it's, it's very obvious and people were just kind of waiting for me to kind of come out. Um, and so on. So, yeah, I, I got really, I've had a mixed positive and negative reaction, you know, not, not all my family was that understanding. Something that was particularly hard for me was how, um, because my parents are, are kind of a different generation to me, their friends and our neighbours and so on weren't so understanding. And then they had to deal with, they've had to deal with more um, kind of ignorance and more kind of hatred towards me than I have, mm. which has been really hard for me because I don't, ever want to make their lives any harder or, or you know kind of put them through anything mm. but as I kept just kind of a consequence of having like a transgender um child they have um so that's really sad yeah, but gen- ultimately you kind of just yeah. go it's awful for them yeah. but those neighbors how how small-minded yeah yeah no my, my mom said something to me the other day and she's like every time I post about you or she posts something about the band and you know it, it's me doing my thing um she watches her Facebook friend numbers drop oh. and and I, I, that made that you know that really like hit me hit me because I can really to physically see that you know happening yeah. um, must be really hard. But yeah, that's that's just the reaction at the moment in the media. We've got such a kind of like onslaught of kind of anti-trans articles mm. and and these articles about like brainwashing and and you know you're all just deluded and so on. When it, it, and it's not true at all. It's absolutely not true. What all trans people want to kind of do is just live their lives i'm just a normal person i eat i sleep you know i like music i like art you know i like films i'm just living my life i'm not doing anything i'm i'm not sent from hell i'm not you know you are human and that is what it comes down to um you kind of touched on it before in terms of like trans rights being uh, quite lagging behind the lgb rights um and violence against trans is probably not addressed the same way as it is for other minority groups yeah i mean (laughs) LGBT is great. I, I, there's been this kind of switch, um, myself included, to, to say queer instead of LGBT because I think there's a lot of people now quite happy, quite happily kind of out in the open, quite prominent figures who don't really define their gender, don't really define their sexuality. Um, and we've seen this in the past. You know, there's, there's 80s icons kind of like, you know, Boy George and uh, Pete Burns who, who were definitely kind of queer in more than a way of just you know, just being a, a gay man. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a lot more to kind of what they were doing, their appearance and so on, and yeah, the, um, how they approached gender that was that was different to just purely just being bisexual or gay. Um, and that's how queer, I think, kind of brings the LGBT community together a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, when we see advancements kind of in LGBT rights, which uh, another point to make on top of this is that the advancements, even though have been perhaps greater than some trans rights haven't actually been that great. And we we see that kind of disconnect a little bit from the trans community feeling as if they don't fit in with the LGB community. And that's that's true at times, but I would like to think that everyone who's kind of queer, and by queer I mean doesn't fit in to this kind of uh, structured idea of... Um, heteronormative and kind of cis-normative and, and cis-meaning when you're assigned the gender at birth and then you live as that gender. Yeah. Um, if you don't kind of fit in with them, you are kind of treated as abnormal and you kind of have this like feeling of being an outcast. And I think trans and LGB people can both relate to that. Mm. So I think that's why there's the similarity there. There's um, a lot of work to be done. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely work to be done. Um, the advancements we've had have been have been great, but you know while there's still, I mean, we 
we can, you know, mention the Orlando massacre where, you know, 50 people died because of their gender or their sexuality that night. And you can't really say that we are equal while that happens. You know, no. in America last year, more trans people were murdered than any year previously. The statistic is one in t- 10 transgender women will be murdered in America. One in three will be sexually assaulted. And that, that is not equal while the statistics for kind of cis women are much lower. No. Well, not necessarily much lower, but, but lower. And um, so w- the advancements need to be made there and the recognition needs to be made. And I think it is just where legislation will be part of it. I also think it's a cultural shift and I think it's people's attitudes and people's understandings. I think as people kind of come to learn that trans people are just trans people and they are just people and people is the, the active word there, not trans, yeah. that, that will change. Those stats are pretty awful. I didn't realise that and I, I nearly swore and then remembered that I'm, I'm on here with you. So I can't absolutely swear. It's awful. I think, I think we should bring some swearing into it sometimes uh, for good yeah, and make a response. Yeah, it's an emotional response, yeah. Going back to what you had said earlier about you coming out and that maybe not it is not a surprise to everyone and it's not something that happens overnight. Um, there seem to be some clues um, to your gender in some of your earlier material, especially in a song called Anxiety, I think, um, on the first demo. Yeah. Was this intentional or did it just kind of come out that way? Um, I've been leaving clues in songs since I was a teenager, since I was really long, young even, not long. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the thing is, when you write a song, it, it's from your your mind. So I've I've always written lyrics and I've always been a lyricist and I've always been transgender. So you can see how like that will find its way in. And particularly as a teenager when I was like really struggling with dysphoria and I like really, you know, I I started to tell people as a teenager as well. This is the thing. A lot of people don't just kind of come out and tell everybody all at once on like one day. It's kind of like, you know, you test the waters and you tell your, you know, your boyfriend and then, you know, you see what happens and so on. Um, but as I, I, I kind of, yeah, I did start to leave clues. I think Queen Z, though, was kind of ruthlessly um, me coming out from the get-go. You know, the first song, the lyric in it saying, um, I'd rather be a girl. And, and that was like the last lyric in the song. And it was really obvious. And then songs like Medicine, that talks about conversion therapy and how people kind of want to you know, keep you as straight and keep you as, you know, cis. Um, and so I don't so want to be and clues, Queen, Queen Z never tried to hide it definitely not clues definitely just saying it how it is yeah how would you describe the band for the people who've not seen you I don't know um, <laughs> we're a bit we're a bit of a weird one I think it's kind of maybe like Dead or Alive or some of that 80s kind of pop stuff meeting a little bit of the heavier kind of rock and punk maybe Susie Sue and the Banshees meets Dead or Alive um, and I've heard that you started a night uh, in Basement of Sound. Uh, yeah. How is it different from the um, the rest of the LGBT scene? Um, at, at the moment, the LGBT scene in Liverpool is very featured around kind of club nights. And there's a few drag shows and they're great. Whereas the live music side of the LGBT scene isn't that massive anyway, kind of nationally. But in Liverpool and in Manchester, we kind of don't have an awful lot kind of going on. So the idea behind doing SAS Den was there would be a monthly or a kind of bi-monthly live music night where people can kind of come and see live music as well as DJs, as well as drag queens, Mm -hmm. as well as, you know, all the other nonsense. Um, But but it would put the emphasis back on, on live music and back on kind of playing and away from late night shows. Yeah. And when is that? Um, the next one is in January, and that's on January the 27th. However, we're also doing it in Manchester the night before on okay. the 26th. So separate from the um, LGTB issues, you are yeah. pretty much just a wild band. Um, what do you want to achieve with the band? <laughs> to be honest, I think we're already achieving it. You know, this, this band was, an, was made as like an outlet for me, and then when I met Jay, it became an outlet for him. And as we've added more members, we've all realised that, you know, we all are kind of outcasts and we all kind of, you know, all have our moments in our lives where we haven't fitted in. And this is the first time where we've kind of all been able to do that and been able to um, have this kind of cathartic experience kind of every night on stage and just outlet that emotion. Um, And the best thing has been to go on tour and see 
other people having that experience and, and playing and as a unit, as an audience and a band, you know, as a crowd, that kind of shared catharsis and that kind of shared like adrenaline rush mm -hmm. is is amazing and I, I couldn't stop that. So I just kind of want to do that forever. I just kind of want to play and tour and, and never stop having that that moment. So oh, wait till it, you're it, old and you're dreading a nice house. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm hoping that never happens. I think it will keep me young if I keep destroying myself on stage every night <laughs> rather than aging quickly. I look at Iggy Pop and I think, like, logically, how how are you still standing up? But I think it's kept him young. I think it's kept him kept him going. <laughs> what are some of the influences of the band? Now, uh, I know you've covered Dizzy Rascal a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> what are the influences of the bands? Because that's quite surprising. Yeah, I mean, we, we've covered a lot of stuff. We did, we did a poll on Twitter the other day and we, we listed all the covers we've done and it went from kind of like Wham! to like a punk band called Crass, you know, to, to Dead or Alive. And I think that kind of sums us up. We're, we've all been in different bands. Myself and Jay, before we were in um, Queen Z, were both in black metal bands, like really heavy kind of metal stuff. But then Frank, our bassist, played in a reggae band. Oh. And then... Uh, our keys player was like a pop singer and, and our drummer was in like just like a kind of indie band so I, so that's what we draw from and, and there's, it's really hard I mean, for actually to try and put on a CD because no one likes the same <laughs> stuff I mean I, I grew up in the punk scene in Liverpool and, and kind of being like you know a dirty kind of crusty punk kid um, crazy house so that you know, yeah, so that's my that's my background. But then Jay is much more into his kind of shoegaze and black metal and kind of droney stuff. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I've already mentioned my my big icons are eighties pop stars, and eventually I'd like to see the band become Depeche Mode, too. And um, yeah. Good that's good luck. Really I think cool. yeah. I think yeah. if you carry on having as much fun as what you're having, then it's inevitable, really, isn't it? Yeah, I think I want to be like a really gnarly Depeche Mode. Like a, a punk Depeche Mode. Write it on your list for Santa. I will do. <laughs> I don't think he's going to deliver that though. Because Santa doesn't exist. Oh, hey, come on. The show was going well. <laughs> <laughs> Live on air. Doing the twist. Thank you for your time today. Where can people check out your Thank music you. and follow you and um, maybe reach out to you and talk to you? We're everywhere. You can find us on all the rubbish streaming platforms, Spotify, iTunes, all of that. Um, if you want to talk to us, you can find us on Facebook or Twitter. I like interacting with people. So if you want to send us hate mail or you want to send us love <laughs> on either of them, go for it. We can chat. That is lovely. We're going to play some of your music now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The station with attitude. KCC Live. Transgender people also seem to get a real bad rap at the minute in media. Mermaids as well, the charity, seem to get loads of rubbish out the media. But even just in general, like, you can pull up dozens of headlines about it. Recently, there was the one about the church saying, um, let boys wear tiaras and stuff. And it's all taken out of context and it's all sorts of twisted and stuff. So we've got Tara, who has been victim of this before and who can hopefully shed some light on this and on transitioning and what she has as an experience. So here's what she had to say. Hi, everybody. And would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Ooh, it's always interesting to know how to start these, but I'm a crazy cat lady who loves Harry Potter. <laughs> um, but I spend most of my time working around equality and diversity um, as a manager for the NHS and as a freelance diversity consultant. Fabulous. Um, Tara, it's a well-known fact that you are a trans person. And um, we, yeah. <laughs> we, so we wanted to ask you a few questions on trans issues. So... What can you give us from your perspective, any issues that you've had around being transgender? I mean, I think trans is such a, a big topic. I'd always start um, by saying when we look at labels anyway, I, I like to look at things from a, a position of privilege um, and say that, that, that everyone has various identities that interacts with their experiences. So any of my experiences are reflective on the fact that I'm also white, um, I also have a disability, I'm also middle class, um, quite well educated, and that will have impacted on my experiences as a trans person that may be different to other people. Um, so thinking back of some of the, the, the challenges when I transitioned, so I transitioned um, about 10 years ago um, back at the University of Liverpool, um, another fabulous city as well as Manchester where I live today. Um, 
and the world actually was quite different 10 years ago it doesn't feel that long ago but at the time I was the first person that had transitioned at university um, trans issues were still something that was not very visible in the media um, unless you watch shows like Eurotrash um, or you were obsessively navigating the internet and could see and find and explore things online and I think one of the things that was quite stark at that point in time for a lot of trans people was that their their identity was very important to them and knowing who you were you'd done a lot of research you'd actually gone and sought out what were these feelings why was I feeling this way how was it were there other people that felt like me and you were very well read and trans was something that was very familiar to you but to the wider world it was something that was very not familiar it was something that, that words were barely used um, if it was it was in very occasional freak show-esque um, newspaper headlines and um, so I think coming out 10 years ago was different to it is today um, and it was more feeling that there was this empty vacuum and how do I fill it and how do I feel that I'm using the right words to describe how I'm feeling when I'm telling people about my identity um, so, so that at that point in time was sort of I think it's hard to imagine a university campus without actually trans issues and trans people feeling like they can come out and feeling like they're visible on campus because there's so much work now going on in LGBT societies across the country that just didn't exist. I mean, back when, um, looking back, it was a time where trans had just been added onto the LGBT campaign at NUS, this idea that, that trans people would be included in LGBT rights. Um, even though trans people led the riots over in America, the Stonewall riots, and have been a big part of the LGBT movement going through history, there was still we were still at a point where people weren't willing to accept that trans people were part of that broader community. So I think that it felt very isolating, but equally there was a strong online community and people wanting to reach out and connect. And I made quite a lot of connections with other trans people at that point in time. Um, so I hope I'm sort of setting the scene about where we are then and, and where maybe things are now, where there's different challenges to, to what people were experiencing about 10 years ago. Does that sort of make sense? Definitely. You can see a good comparison. Would you say that there's more education and awareness now then? I'd say that, um, that language is something that people are more aware of. You hear words more. Um, I think it's... It, it depends on what circles you move in and what parts of the UK and what media you listen to and who your friends are. Um, and it's really easy sometimes, especially if you do jobs and work and move in some of the circles that I do and goes back to that issue of privilege that you think, well, everybody's going to know everything about trans issues now because everybody I know talks and engages on trans issues. But actually, you've got to have a reason to do that and actually a reason to understand language. And if the only place that you get your knowledge and information is from newspapers like the express the daily mail or the sun you'll be aware that trans people exist which is maybe something that was different in the past so there is movement there because there's a story or two every single day in those newspapers about trans people but i'd say the level of negativity is greater um, around some of those stories so sometimes bad information's worse than no information and i think we're entering that sort of era at the moment where it just feels that there's so much misinformation and bad information being put out there it is increasing the visibility and the acknowledgement of how many trans people there are but it isn't always moving in the right direction and it's leading to some of the negative stories so tara speaking of the media um do you want to tell us about that news headline there's been a few so like but <laughs> I, I, know one, I know you want the main i mean um tell me about I, them all but, I think a lot of trans people at, at some point or other in the UK find themselves either in dispute with the media because of the amount of negative stories they see or they find themselves um, the subject of some type of media story. Um, I mean, the story we're talking back is um, my famous headline in The Sun um, when they thought that my sex life was appropriate and a picture of me outside Downing Street talking about me taking the whip um, and as somebody who's very open about being supportive of alternative lifestyles and um, the BDSM community and people who want to express their um, selves in many different ways it I suppose it wasn't shocking that at some point or other our conservative with a small c 
world <laughs> would, would want to attack that in some way. Um, what I found quite interesting, though, was that I've still got an email somewhere that, that from the editor of The Sun telling me that my um, sex life was in the public interest and that the British public would want to know um, who I slept with and, and what sex acts I got up to. Um, now, why that's relevant to what we're talking about now is I, I feel that trans people are judged um, with a different bar. Um, at the time, it's because I was involved in politics and I was hoping to maybe one day becoming an MP before I realised the world was very nasty and I'm much like other pursuits, which I can dedicate my energy to now as I've grown up. Um, and maybe some of our politicians could grow up and we'd actually all be in a better place. But um, wh when we judge trans people alongside people who are not trans, the media's obsession with sex um, and the media's obsession with trying to pull trans people down and dig up histories um, on us is is really quite vile. And we're not judged for anything that we've done wrong, but we're judged on simply existing or leading lives that other people already leave. So I can give the example of um, the trans woman who um, has become a women's officer for one of the constituency Labour parties in the UK, um, Lily. Um, has faced horrendous attacks in the last couple of weeks in the Times, simply for existing and becoming a women's officer. Nothing else is just the fact that they're trans and they've become a women's officer and they've faced the national media's spotlight and focus on them. And I think that's what creates some of the barriers for trans people succeeding and moving forward, because when you have that level of focus and attention, on you for no good reason, it's bound to create situations where trans people just don't want to advance, they don't want to go and take up different positions because they're worried about actually what that's going to mean for them, those people around them, if they're parents or their family members, their loved ones, but also their own mental health and actually not wanting to have to deal with the media day in, day out, just in their pursuit of a career or um, wanting to stand for public office or be a public servant. And it, it's really quite sad. I mean, it does completely baffle me that they feel like it's fair game for a person's personal life just because they're based on something that's in the public eye. It completely baffles me. And I mean, I'm sure you know how us people of Liverpool feel about that particular paper anyway. I, 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 I wear it as a badge of honour the fact that, that <laughs> I had a fun journalist running down my garden path when I lived on the Wirral, waving a tablet computer at me and telling me that I was going to be in the sun. So I, oh. I, I don't see it as a negative. I see it as a, as a positive that I'm hated by the sun. And I'm sure... <laughs> The people of Liverpool would agree. <laughs> it is. That's quite a badge to wear. Please tell me you've got a copy of it, like, over your toilet or something. <laughs> I do have a copy saved. I'm, I'm trying to think where would be appropriate. But I said Save I have it above got... the toilet, obviously. I, I, I need to put the email as well where it does say, said from the editor te where we, I'd complained, telling me that they did feel that my sex life was in the public interest. That's what I do wonder. I don't get why they think that. It really is not as interesting as people actually believe. <laughs> I always joke when you look at porn and, and look at what people think happens in uh, people that, that really enjoy looking at alternative sex lives and doing different activities, that it's this really glamorous, sensationalised world where actually most of the time spent laughing and joking and playing board games than <laughs> doing anything that, that's in the warped imagination of some of these editors. But yeah, I, I don't know anybody in the British media that really cares about what I do in the bedroom other than my partner, really. And even then... She probably doesn't care half the time. It is something that I wonder why they've sort of come at this angle against trans people. It seems that everything you see is negative. You don't see anything positive. Um, I, we were talking earlier, I was telling you about Abby, who, you know, was formerly yeah. in the army, did tours in Iraq and everything. As Abby, yeah, they still slay her. I mean, I think the problem is that anything that's different, people are scared of. Anything that challenges the status quo and simply by existing trans people can be perceived as a threat because some of the things that were some of the very principles that all of our stereotypes and privilege in society is built up this idea that um gender is as simple as whatever the doctor told you way back when and um, that is it um, nobody has any control over that nobody has any expression of their own sense of self that most people when you talk about trans issues they don't really remember ever being told about what gender meant. It was just one of those very simple matters of fact things. Now, if now we're showing that that isn't the case, trans people just existing and being visible in society challenges one of those those bedrocks, one of those foundations. 
And I don't think it's just about gender that makes people worry. It's people with privilege of all a whole variety of different reasons are worried about what that means for them and what that means about them giving up some of that privilege if society starts to change. Um, we don't start to base things on historic labels, but actually just based on how talented people are or um, who they are, um, rather than who their parents were or who their grandparents were. And I think all of those sort of complex notions start to come into being that creates this both conscious and unconscious negativity that gets directed towards trans people. Definitely. Um, you see a lot of it in America as well at the moment and it seems like everybody's first reaction is, oh, won't somebody please think of the children? And I'm like, well, my children are around trans people and they're quite happy, thank you very much. What's your issue? It, it's very 1980s and, and gay people and Section yes. 20. I was on um, Channel 5 News last year talking about um, the CBBC show, which was... Um, had a trans um, child um, oh, yeah. on the show and um, it was exploring bullying and their experiences at school um, and I was debating somebody from um, Christian Concern and I say debating um, it, it was just a barrage of this is sexualizing children do I ch should our children be seeing trans people uh, and put simply trans people exist children see trans people because yeah. their parents because they'll see other trans people at school, because they'll see teachers who are trans, because they'll see family members that are trans. trans I walk down the street and go on buses, surprisingly, and see children. Okay. Um, so it, it's important that we make sure that our children understand the diversity of the world, whether it's trans, ethnicity, religion, disability. You're equipping children to be able to engage with the world that they live in. But also, actually, when you're looking at identities that they might come out with because actually identities that's part of their self awareness and growth they know that if they are trans or if they are gay or if they are bisexual or any other um, identity that if they do come out and express that difference from the normatives that society is imposing that they're going to feel supported and that there's other people that share that identity and that they don't have to feel alone and I think that those are the messages that we should be talking about to make sure children feel valued and can go on to be successful and have fab lives rather than all the negativity that you hear these say Christian concern and some of the people that supposedly feminists that, that I don't really think can call themselves feminists they're just transphobic oh I don't nice. even start me on the feminist yeah end. but that's another just show got, that one <laughs> we do a whole show on that on that group of people oh but... too right too right uh, <laughs> I've got my own soapbox on that one but yeah, no, I can definitely see where you're coming from with the children. Um, we were talking about the gender neutral debate as well today in the station. And we were saying about, you know, I've got friends on, on Facebook and stuff and I see them and they're like, oh, gender neutral now, I wouldn't bring my children off. And I was like, oh no, you don't understand. You don't get it. And I think that's part of the problem. People don't understand. They don't get that being gender neutral doesn't mean that your child can't be male or female. It means that your male child can play with something that would be perceived as female and vice versa. It's not just as simple as being like, no, you're androgynous and that's it. But I think the way you described it is really apt. It's saying that if your child plays with a certain type of toy, you don't get somebody going, you're a wimp, you're a yeah. whatever other abusive language, or which surely we would want all children protected from stigma or abuse or bullying because they decided that they wanted to play with one doll or one teddy bear or one outfit or one superhero or whatever it is they want to play with because they're children and they're playing yeah. and they're exploring the world parents and people that want to support children teachers or just all of us really humans it's about supporting children to be themselves and explore the world around them in a safe and positive way and gender neutrality if we want to give it a label is about removing the stigma that's attached to people that children that are called boys and children that are, that are girls um, being stigmatised because they want to play with superheroes or they want to go and play um, with a princess dress, um, which I don't know many people that, that feel that children should be bullied for playing with those toys. So it, it's not a trans thing. It's just a sense of decency and, and kindness and hopefully okay. advancement from where we've been in the past where children were stigmatised for what they played with. I can definitely agree with that. Do you want to, where are you now in terms of, you know, your, yourself and, you know, obviously you've got a job that you enjoy, a partner, you know. So, so my happiness and sense of self in the world. Yes. 
Well, um, <laughs> it depends on different days. Um, I think like everybody, um, if I've seen too many news headlines, I think sort of at the moment it's the world just seems to be one negative headline and one negative headline about trans people every single day. And I think that really does pull people down. Um, and, and I said, maybe we forget that trans people have different identities as well. I said, some trans people have mental health issues. Some trans people um, have different privileges that allow them to um, be more resilient or deal with stuff. So I think that's the world at the moment is very turbulent if you're a trans person and, and seeing that. I think as a, myself, um, I'm quite a positive person. So I hopefully we will go through some of the battles that we've gone through that lots of minorities have gone through and will continue continue to see some positive progress and a world that's more inclusive and the talents and the amazing trans people that might go on to cure cancer or do a whole host of other amazing things the same way people who are black and gay and who face um that, that still face discrimination racism and homophobia that 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 we get a world where their talents are recognized and valued as well i mean that's the future that i want to see and um, for me myself hopefully um continue to be happy, continue to play with my cats, um, continue to chat to fabulous people like yourself, um, and really just not be negative, because I think the negativity and not hate, so I often see trans people getting angry and hateful, and I understand where that comes from, because it's difficult when you're facing that barrage, but ultimately hate and anger just impacts on yourself, and you're just letting people that want to hurt you win even more. And it's so much better to fight hate with love and to focus on the things that are really good in your life and however small. Um, and that's what I try to do day in, day out as much as I can. You're right. That's a great way to look at it. Um, Tara, if you could give anybody advice, you know, somebody that's not used to people who are trans, that's never met a trans person before, what would you say to them? I think with everything it's just engage somebody as a person i think one of the things um we're talking about before the show was about labels and and how do how do you engage with labels and um as i sort of said already i am trans but i'm tara um and i, I want to be engaged with as me i want people to value not that i'm trans but my perspectives my understanding my um passions the things that i care about in life and I want to engage and connect with other people's passions and things that they care about in life. Um, but people to reflect the language that, that I want to use to talk about myself, as I'll reflect the language that other people want to talk to. And just engage someone on their level and be open-minded and don't try and assert your own judgment on those other people. One of the things that I know I've, I've learned going through life over, um, particularly the last 10 years as, as an adult, um, that you constantly getting things wrong and your views are constantly changing but they're changing because of other people around you and when you listen to other people and let other people challenge your views that's where we get to grow as individuals ourselves so hopefully if people haven't met a trans person they're open-minded and can talk maybe the trans person can share some perspectives that help you understand yourself a little bit more and move forward and hopefully maybe you'll share something positive and compassionate back to you Thank you so much for that advice, Tara. It was great. And thank you for coming to talk to us on Out There. And I'm sure we'll speak to you again soon. Anytime. Always happy to come and share a smile. The Station with Attitude. ACC Live. Transgender issues are one that's actually really close to my heart. Um, I'm not personally transgender, I'm cis, which means basically I was born female with female genitalia and I identify as female with female genitalia. You know, that's me, I'm female, I'm feminine. Um, but I have a few friends that are trans and, you know, I've got friends that we've nearly lost because there's been no help there, no one for them to help when they've needed it to understand what they've been going through um so 
when I was asking my friends, you know, what's the issues? What's the problems? What do we need? So I was like, right, how can I help? How can I do this? So I decided to become a counsellor and I'm currently studying. I'm on my level three now and I've got another year and then I'm qualified and I'm hoping to become an LGBT plus friendly counsellor. It's unreal the amount of help that is needed, but that isn't out there. It's like we're losing people left, right and centre. We've lost hundreds of people to suicide this year who are transgender because they don't feel like they've got the support and like they're going to be accepted. And it's ridiculous. I was lucky enough last week to visit the vigil for the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And I must admit, it was really moving and it was so upsetting. And there was a fantastic speech by a lady who helped with Mermaids, the charity. And they were saying that even just that they'd found out the day before they'd lost another one of their mermaids. Now, mermaids are a fantastic charity and they deal with younger children, younger people. Um, I think it's from 11 to 18, I think, off the top of my head. Um, and can you imagine that? That's three they've lost this year. They were saying they've lost three people between the age of 11 and 18. And I must admit, I got a real lump in my throat about it and I was really upset because I'm a mum. I've got, I've got a son who's eight and a daughter who's four. And I can't imagine how much it must hurt to lose one of them children just because they struggle because they don't identify as the gender that they believe they should have been born into. And it just seems like such a trivial thing. Um, so we're lucky enough to be able to speak to mermaids and this is what they had to say. I am joined by Jan from Mermaids. Hi, Jan. Hi. And so we are going to be chatting today about mermaids. And if you've not heard about the mermaids group, Jan is here to explain exactly who they are and what they do. Okay, so Mermaids is an organisation that runs all over the UK. And we provide support for individuals with gender identity issues. We also provide support for their families and for their network of professionals. So doctors, schools, youth workers dance teachers, anything at all that's related to them, we su provide support and information. How can people um, reach this support? Is it something that's online? or? Yep, yeah, so we've got a website which is www.mermaidsuk.org.uk We have a helpline which is 0344 and you can also send in an email via the website. And so this is available to both young people, but also parents as well, and anyone else who's kind of listening and might want to get more information. Yeah, absolutely. And we support young people from very, very young, right up until their 20th birthday. So for anyone who's listening who isn't 100% sure um, on what Mermaids does in terms of uh, young people going through transgender issues or transitioning. Are yeah. you able to explain a little bit more about what exactly it is? Yeah, so in its simplest form, if you are cisgendered, it just means that your brain and body match. So you have a female body and a female brain or a male body and a male brain. If you are trans or transgender, it means that the match is, is the opposite to your birth gender. So you may have a male body, but your brain identifies as female or you may have a female body and your brain identifies as male. And that can be to varying degrees. So people who are not right over the far side with their identity will identify as non-binary. So it just means that they are human. They are neither drawn to male or female. It's only more recently that there seems to be a bit more information available and support available. Do you, do you think that's a case or is it just a case that maybe the media or... I know those programmes like this morning have touched on certain um, subjects... Is it because yeah. of um, media that it's, there are more support and networks available or is it they've always been there, it's just the case of we've not reached out to them? Well, Mermaids has actually been going for over 20 years. We were founded in 1995 and the National Health Service Gender Identity Clinic has been running since the early 70s. So transgender children and young people have always existed the, there are two main differences. Firstly, we now have equality laws, so people are protected. So they can stay in education, they can continue to live their lives. And they've got protection to be able to do that. And then another side is that we now have more diversity in media. So we are seeing it. It's also in our culture. 
So young people are able to self-identify. They're able to see someone, whether it's online or on TV or in a film or in a book, and say, oh, that's me. That's how I feel. And then they can self-identify. And so with Maya Maids, um, are you able to provide information support for those who, because I think, again, it's that myth. I know you mentioned off a little bit about myth busting. So that if someone is going through some identity issues or a little bit of confusion, probably more so than identity issues, I'm, I'm assuming that surgery and things is not always the way forward and there are other things that are able to help. Well, surgery is not for anyone and it's only available in adult services anyway. So that's a, a huge part of what I do is myth busting. The treatment pathway in the UK, um, it's provided by the Tavistock and Portman, which is part of the NHS and... Only when a a young person hits puberty, and again, they have to have lots of assessments by gender identity experts, then they may be offered a puberty blocking medication, which is completely reversible. It literally just puts a pause button on puberty. Take the medication away, biological puberty will continue. And until you're 16, that's the only thing available, as well as psychological support. So do you think maybe at some point the media or social media or myths have played a part in the fear that is associated with uh, transitioning or trans issues? Yes, absolutely. And it's really important that we provide that support for young people. Stonewall issued a report this year which shows that almost 50% of young trans people will attempt suicide. 84% have self-harmed and 75% are actively self-harming. And yet we know that if a young person is supported to socially transition, and that just means, you know, changing the name, changing their appearance, parents, it's got nothing to do with any medical intervention, that the outcomes are so much more positive and that their mental health is the same as the rest of their peer group. So it doesn't have to be a negative outcome, which is why support and understanding is absolutely vital. And is the Stonewall Report something that is... Is that information fed into schools and things or is this something that the schools will be required to seek out? It's being used as part of a HBT project. So it's anti-homophobic, biphobic and transphobic anti-bullying programme, which we are part of the consortium who are delivering that into schools. Um, So we are working closely with the Department of Education um, and the Government Equalities Office to get that information out there so that young people can be supported. That's perfect because I think sometimes... I think people might play the ignorance is bliss kind of cards and they don't know about it and they don't have to know about it. Therefore, they will just dismiss it, basically. Yeah, it's available online and it was published in The Guardian in June. So just going through um, some of the myth busting and some of the... um, You're the lady who can help break down some of the confusion, basically, um, to do with sexuality and gender identity. Is that right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think the reason a lot of people have struggled to understand what transgender or non-binary or any of that is, it's because they attach it to a sexuality and I think that's why they can't understand when young people identify as transgender. But they are very, very different things. Yes, they're both under the rainbow, but they're at completely opposite ends. Your sexuality is who you go to bed with. Your gender identity is who you go to bed as. It's who you are and it's got absolutely nothing to do with sex. It's a nice way of actually remembering that, isn't it? Yeah, very simple. And again, I'm assuming this is these are the parts of the project that you do take into schools and making, I think sometimes more of the older generation. Now, I know some people will disagree with that and so will say, no, it's not. But I, in my experience, working with young people, they tend to be a lot more savvy and a bit more open-minded now, whereas a generation above sometimes are not as quick to be... Um, just a bit more open-minded towards anything that's different, and I mean any kind of change? Um, I think you can get people who are bigoted or people who are not prepared to listen in any age group and in from any background. Um, we've got lots of grandparents and great-grandparents who are real huge supporters um, you know, of the children that we work with. Um, and I have been told by an 80-year-old gentleman that I should not allow anyone to use age as an excuse for bigotry because we live in the information age and information is at your fingertips if you can be bothered to go and look. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? If you want to be open-minded and you want to understand things, you will, regardless of age or what is available to you. Yes, yes. And I would say to anyone, 
you know, if you want to learn a bit more, there are three videos that I would recommend, very short videos. One is Jackie's story, one is Jamie's story, and then the other one is one of our patrons, Captain Hannah Winterbourne. She's a captain in the British Army. Um, and it just shows how the British, the armed forces dealed, you know, dealt with her transition. And it was really straightforward, no fuss. And it just gives you a better understanding, really. And how can people watch those videos? Can you just recap it? Yeah, they're on, they're, they're on our website. So you can, you can either look them up on YouTube. It was um, Hannah Winterbourne when she was on The One Show. And then there is Jamie's story and Jackie's story, which they're both online uh, or on our website. For some of the young people who are listening, we've got a youth audience and sometimes it can be quite a scary thing to speak to somebody or to reach out. Listening on radio or on your phone and, and communicating via text and things is a very safe uh, way of doing things. For yeah. those young people who are listening who might relate to everything that you're talking about, what do you advise them? I would say to reach out, but to reach out to the right people. So if you can find out where your local LGBT group is, and get involved there. You can go onto our website. We do have meetups. We also have a private online forum for teens, which is completely safeguarded. You do have to be verified to get on there. Obviously, we need to make sure you are who you are. Um, you know, but you will be looked after. You will be listened to. You will be given the correct information. No one will tell you what to do. It will just be support and information. And we can also help you with coming out. That's brilliant. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will make sure that all the information for Mermaids goes up on our website uh, and you can find it um, at kcclive.com. This is 97.8 FM. KCC Live. KCC Live. KCC Live. KCC Live. KCC Live. KCC Live. KCC Live.